Welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Mado, joined as always by Chris Bougay. Hey, Chris. Hey, Rachel. How's it going? It's good. We're diving back in to the questions. Yes. So a couple episodes ago, uh, a Patreon member had written us and we had started answering some of the questions, but this was kind of a a long email, multiple multiple parts, multiple questions. And we knocked out part one, uh, but we have not. There's there's more here. There's more here that we have to to take a look at and uh, give some feedback and insights on. So the second part of this question is talking about specific things to the device. So she says, um, so-and-so is a vegetarian. I need you to delete all the meat from their device Um, or deleting all the COVID things since we're back in person now. Um, She says, it drives me nuts since I know our kids need consistent access to this vocabulary to talk about these things, even if they're not requesting them. But I get about three requests of this type per per day and can't seem to break into modeling and not just training requests. Yeah, so let's talk about that there because um, that's kind of a big thing about... uh, um, first, we've got the the whole pragmatic function of being stuck on requesting, right? That's that's one issue. Another issue is um, the staff that she's working with wanting to remove vocabulary, and then a third that I think is related to that second one is the fact that maybe they added vocabulary that was temporary, um, or they were thinking is temporary, and as opposed to potentially teaching core vocabulary or teaching the spelling of those words, they added words. Um, And so there's a lot to digest there. Which one do we tackle first, do you think? Um, Well, let's talk about the the temporary vocabulary, because I feel like that's the last thing you said. And I feel like this is this is important to talk through, because I think that what happens oftentimes when, you know, you walk into a classroom is the first thing that a teacher says uh, or a paraprofessional is, oh, like there's a lesson about volcanoes. So we're about to talk about volcanoes. Let's put all of the vocabulary we need into his system so he's able to communicate about volcanoes. And so it's like lava and like we start getting super specific with all of this fringe vocabulary. And one easy switch, well, I say easy, it's not very easy actually for a lot of teams, um, but I'm thinking about descriptive teaching, which we talk about a lot, Chris, Um, this idea of using core language to describe those highly specific fringe words. Uh, We know core is more generalizable. So we can use the word hot, for example, to talk about a volcano. Um, Instead of talking about lava, we can describe the lava. Um, You know, it goes down or it goes up, it's hot. Um, things like that. So we're not just teaching vocabulary that's really highly specific to a lesson. And then we move on from that lesson. And, you know, what's the likelihood that a child's going to need to talk about lava in their daily life? (laughs) Like pretty low. Even if you were in Hawaii. Yes. Even if you were in Hawaii, you still pretty probably wouldn't talk about lava (laughs) that often. But you might say something's hot, right? That's a very common thing. We can talk about food being hot, the weather being hot. Um, all of these things. And I just think it's easier said than done. So when I first started, I said, it's easy. This is an easy shift. It's actually not easy. Um, It's not easy to train people to start thinking through core language and how to describe through core. Um, But I definitely think that's something that if you can start making the shift over to that, um, you see a lot of success because again, we're, we're being really strategic about the words that we're teaching. When we're working with complex communicators, we need to really get strategic because it's these words don't come quickly. The motor plans don't, we don't learn the motor plans right away. We, there's so many things that go into it. Um, you know, kids aren't always motivated to communicate about that specific thing. Um, and it, instead it feels more like academic or work. Um, and so there's so many factors. And so we need to make sure that we're like packing a punch when we're deciding what words we're targeting. Um, when we're working with students. So a, a couple things that come to mind here for me is um, temporary vocabulary. I use that phrase that the person writing didn't, but I think that's how some teachers might think about it. Like we need to temporarily use this 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 
content, uh, this heavy curriculum word that uh, is this specific for this unit. So temporarily we need to use it and then we won't use it ever again. But te- there's no such thing as a temporary word. Like once it's a word, it's a word and you use it and you should uh, have it in your lexicon. You just might not use it as frequently. So maybe it's a matter of using the, the adjectives frequently and infrequently. Um, but the second concept there, uh, that, that whole concept of descriptive teaching, um, I think the world of speech now has moved and understands, uh, and I think a lot of teachers understand this too, uh, that that we need to be modeling on the device. Like that, that is a known thing now. Aided language stimulation. There's probably still play, a lot of places that don't know it. Like clearly, in uh, this situation, they're still not necessarily modeling. But the idea that they should be modeling, oh, the idea that I should be teaching core vocabulary, I think there's a level of cognitive awareness people have. It's just they don't know how how to do that, right? So, um, like, if you're playing tennis, I know I'm supposed to swing the racket and hit the ball. I don't know how to swing the racket and hit the ball. And I think that is where that magic word of coaching comes in. Uh, descriptive teaching is a skill, just like aided language stimulation is a skill, just like hitting a tennis ball with a tennis racket is a skill. It takes time. It takes practice. It takes effort. And the way to do that is focus on going on the tennis court. Like, you you don't get better at playing tennis by playing golf, you know? Um, so what I mean by that is this particular person is asking for us, how can we help, how can I help these teachers understand how to do this? It would be scheduling out some coaching sessions on one salient point. I'm going to pick modeling and we're going to practice modeling. We're going to get you better at modeling. And I know I can't focus on the descriptive teaching right now. Yes, it's another issue. We'll get to that somewhere down the line, but we're just going to focus on modeling or for a different teacher. You know what? They're modeling. They're trying. They just don't know the right words to model and they're still okay. Well, in that case, maybe we're focusing over here on descriptive teaching and we're going to do this coaching on, on a number of sessions where we're focused just on descriptive teaching. And we're going to measure that. We're going to talk about, okay, how many times did you use the target word and you modeled the, the, the sorry, the, the curriculum word like volcano or lava versus how many times did you use descriptive teaching? We're going to count those up and we're going to measure that so we can see your growth. I completely agree, Chris. One very practical thing that I do with some of the people that I'm coaching, um, and I say people because it's parents, it's teachers, it's BCBAs, it's you know, it's a lot of different kinds of practitioners and, of course, parents. Um, one thing that's really a great exercise is um, you know, take an activity, a book, a lesson, an art and craft, arts and craft activity, and prior to starting that. I coach communication partners on and ask them, what core word do you think would be really great to target in this activity? Like go through the book, let's go through the book, see if there's a theme here. Let's think about our lesson about volcanoes. Like what's a theme here? And like what's one core word we think we can target, um, you know, even if it's just a handful of times. Because I think what happens is like, communication partners feel this stress like i have to communicate all i have to model all these different core words like up and down and in and out and open and different and and that's fine and that's great if if you have the capacity to do that and eventually communication partners do have that capacity but in the beginning stages if you're not you know versed at modeling then focus on like a single word. Um, you know, we need to build capacity with the communication partners that we're working with. And if that means just like saying, okay, yes, hot is a really great target word to, you know, think about while you're doing this volcano lesson. Like, let's like see how many times you can model hot, right? That ends up with communication partners that feel like oh wow, I've done something, I've been successful, I was able to model hot seven times. Uh, Whatever it might be, like that's progress. Um, And I think what happens, and we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, people feel so overwhelmed that they they don't do anything. (laughs) That they just like are frozen and like, I'm not sure what to do and so I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna do what I always do, which is I'll just have them ask for the snack at the end. (laughs) You know, and so it's just like really important to get you know, communication partners feeling successful because that momentum can build over time and that's how skills, you know, develop and grow. 
Now, there's something else that they mentioned in the in the email here that I think is a slightly separate issue, but it's um, maybe just as important. It's um, sometimes it sounds like the teachers are potentially removing words from the device, either because they think the student doesn't need them anymore um, or because it doesn't fit into the behaviors that the student is having. So, for instance, if they were constantly requesting um, potato chips and potato chips are not something the student is allowed to have in their diet, well, well, let's just remove potato chips, right? Um, and, you know, at, at a, on a surface level, it seems to make sense. Like, if we just take that thing away, then they can't request it. And the analogy I use, some people use the duct tape analogy, right? You know what that is. That is like, well, that's sort of like putting duct tape over their mouth, you know? I like to use a different analogy, and that is, uh, it's a little bit more drastic, but I think it is also um, just as poignant, is if a student was picking their nose all the time, the behavior was picking their nose, you, you, what would you do? You wouldn't cut off their finger or put tape over their nostrils, right? You would, you would teach them not to pick their nose, right? You do all the sorts of other strategies. Um, and that's the same thing. You can't remove the words. It, once a word is on a device, it should just be there forever. Uh, hiding, the, hiding the words. Maybe there's some times where I would hide a word temporarily, cl- clearly masking and things like that. But in this sort of case where we teach the appropriate use of the words or, or again, use descriptive teaching to teach uh, around the words. Yeah. I mean, I, I always, whenever I'm making decisions about an AAC system or AAC in general, I feel like I always try to think through the lens of the student. And imagine how frustrating it would be to have chips on your device and you have that thought chips and then you go to execute the motor plan and then all of a sudden it's not there. Mm -hmm. And that causes more behavior because it's like, I, where are the chips? Where are my chips? I know where they are and I want to communicate that I want them. Even if I'm not allowed to have them, I still should have the ability to communicate that. And when we block kids from being able to communicate what they're thinking, not only does it can it cause more behaviors, but it also it it causes kids to feel like frustrated at the idea of communicating because now all of a sudden I have an idea I'm trying to communicate it to you but I can't and so you know that's not what we should be doing when we're working with students with complex communication needs we need to be doing the opposite we need to be excited every time they're communicating. We need to show them every time you have a thought, I want you to tell it to me. Even if that means that we have to say there, you can't have potato chips right now. No, we don't have potato chips. Potato chips are gone. No, like, you know, we need to keep responding as if we, if we were working with a student who had verbal speech. Um, and so I just like, it never really makes sense to me. Um, just because I think through the student's lens, how frustrating would that be if like you had access to say what was on your mind and then all of a sudden it was gone? If you can't do it with a student who's verbal, then don't do it for a student who uses AAC. Right? That might be a, a simple line to remember. Um, there's the, the other thing there, too, is it, we're using this, this, this example of chips, right? So imagine a student coming over, finding the word chips. It hasn't been removed, and they hit chips, and they hit it a couple times. Well, the immediate assumption, for whatever reason, is that that is a request. And I think that's where this person was starting. And they, they're trying to move beyond requests. But what if that's not what we interpreted it as? Like, what if that was commenting on the chips or saying, oh, don't like chips? You know, there's so many different communication functions that we could be interpreting that as, as opposed to requesting. So it's not surprising to me that people get stuck in requesting if every time someone presses a noun on a device, we interpret that as a request. What if we just didn't do that? What if we interpreted it as more than requesting? No, I completely agree with that. And this this is reminding me of a, a client that I'm working with right now. And his ABA team has programmed like lots of kind of carrier phrases into a device. So like, it'll be like it, they're trying to teach commenting, right? And so they're like, it is red. And so like the student has to say like, it is red. But now what's happening is like, we're like, what color popsicle do you want? And he's like, it is red. (laughs) And so it's just like, we don't need to jump to that carrier phrase. He's at the single word level. Let's just show him how to use that single word for a different purpose beyond just asking for what he wants. You know, I think that like people don't always think that because again, people are used to thinking through the lens of requesting. And to be fair, like that's where children typically start off with, right? Like that's the first pragmatic, 
you know, function that kids get behind because they're like, wow, the power of my words. I said chips, I got them. Um, you know, but like I think if we start showing kids how that word can be used for different different purposes, um, I think that again, like that's part of the problem with this like vicious cycle of things just being requesting. It's like that's how we're treating it. If we treat it in other ways, then I think, like you said, Chris, I think that we can start showing students how to use communication for other purposes beyond just requesting. Um, Something else I feel like we get stuck in, Rachel, is the idea that the people listening to this podcast right now, hey, if you're listening to this podcast right now, I get the impression all the time, Rachel, that they're nodding along with us. Like they, yep, we know. We get, yep, Chris, Rachel, we know. We we feel for the person that wrote this email, you know, because um, we're feeling that way too. And so get uh, another vicious cycle is just each of us feeding each other. Somehow we have to get this, this message across to the larger population of educators working with students. And so we would invite you to share this episode or um, at least this portion of the episode say just listen to the first 20 minutes of this um, because I think it might be uh, it might help educators kind of become more aware that it's not just you that's saying this that there's a whole fleet of people out there that are um, that are working through uh, these different ways of implementing AAC I love it Chris I'm always can get behind sharing the podcast out. We would love for you to share our podcast. We would also love to, for you to give us a review on iTunes. Chris, it's been a second since we read an iTunes review. Maybe it's been a second since we've gotten one. I have to go and check. <laughs> uh, but we definitely love to hear from you guys. And sharing this podcast just shares awareness about AAC, which Chris and I are very passionate about. Um, so we would love for you to share. And also join our Facebook group. There's always some fun things going off in the Facebook group. Um, so just search Talking With Tech and you'll find us there. And then, of course, this message is from a Patreon member. So we would love for you to join our Patreon, patreon.com backslash Talking With Tech. Um, There you'll find tons of behind the scenes videos, podcast episodes, um, lots of resources and therapy ideas, um, tons of stuff in there. We've been doing this for quite a while at this point for our Patreon, Chris. So we have lots and lots of content um, for the last almost two years, it feels like. Are we coming up on two years? I think in, 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 in January? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, so let me, Rachel, let me tell you about the interview today. I'll keep this short because the interview is a little bit long um, and it's amazing. It's with somebody named Jamie Grant. And uh, Jamie was assigned in her graduate program, I think it was her graduate program, to talk to somebody who works in the field. And so she got my name and uh, we partnered up and we started our conversation where she was interviewing me about, uh, you know, learning more about assistive technology and, and AAC. And I was like, Hey, what do you, what do you say? You want to be on the podcast? Let's record this. And so that's what this is. It's a, it's a conversation. Now this particular person has been working in education for a while and is now pursuing like higher education. So, or different education. So Oh, and because this interview was so dense and we covered so many topics, we decided to split this up into two episodes. So let's listen to part one with Jamie Grant. Here at Talking With Tech, we're excited to partner with Smiles for Speech. This organization provides children with special needs living in impoverished communities the intervention and resources needed to help children reach their full potential. Smiles for Speech aims to provide long-term sustainable solutions for children worldwide. Their mission is to distribute educational materials, provide training to teachers and families without access to appropriate intervention, and to create global awareness on the importance of therapeutic services to support children in need. With your help, Smiles for Speech will continue to broaden their reach in assisting children living in disadvantaged communities gain access to the therapy services and education they need to thrive. To support this organization, go to smilesforspeech.org to learn more about this organization and to offer your support. That's smilesforspeech.org. Well, hello there, Jamie, and welcome to the Talking With Tech podcast. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. My job in the district, I am actually um, an ed tech coach. <laughs> so, oh, fantastic. So yeah, I noticed. My thing, yeah. 
I noticed in the link. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Cause I was like, uh, you know, I was talking to my wife as we were getting ready this morning and she's like, so what do you got going on? I'm like, well, there's this person from George Mason university and um, she's going to contact me and we're going to talk about assistive technology. And I just noticed the link and it's from Beaufort. Am I saying that right? Beaufort, South Carolina. Well, if you're in North Carolina, it's Beaufort. But when you're down here in South Carolina, it's Beaufort. As Beaufort. A- okay. Yes. <laughs> like beautiful. Be- <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, um, Jamie Grant here in Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, my title changes every day because... Um, Prior to the position that I have now, I worked as an educational technology coach, and we've had several different titles, instructional technology, specialist, so on and so forth. And about seven, about seven or eight years ago, um, I got really intrigued about assistive technology because I saw that the population in our district was grossly underserved. Um, A lot of our coaches did not go into special education classrooms. And so I was I was working my way through the system, so to speak. Um, I started befriending a lot of the special education teachers. And of course, because they always had snacks in their class. (laughs) Um, So um, so I started work with them. And then after um, a couple of years, I began to work primarily Um, with special education teachers. And in the last two years, um, I made the full transition because I started, um, and this it's it's a long story, but I'll make it a little bit short. Um, I used to make sugar scrub. And so that's how I got introduced to the people here in the special education department because they wanted to buy sugar scrub for me. And I partnered with, at that time, she was the autism manager, Allison Marshall and Kathy Cato. They were the AT specialists in the district and they were old school and they needed somebody to help with the technology side because they had no idea what was going on, Mm -hmm. like with software and the other digital stuff. And so they just dragged me with them everywhere. And lo and behold, I started gradually working more and more with special education. And when we got a new director, they gave me the choice. Do I stay with the educational technology or do I make that transition to special education? And I made the transition. Did they create a position for you? That is, what's your job title now? Um, On paper, I'm still an educational technology coach, but Mm -hmm. I changed my title. I'm an assistive technology specialist. I do a lot of AAC assessments. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I do pretty much down here. I am the AT girl. Yeah. So okay, let me ask, how big is your school district? Um, we have um, 25,000 students and okay. growing. And growing. Um, we have a lot of students. We have a lot of families now um, moving down because of our autism program. I don't know how. It's, it's like a strange shift happened like we maybe had like um about 12 to 20 students that were diagnosed um they were integrated in um a self-contained classroom but now the population down here has exploded to the point that we've had to create an actual program so we have the blast program um where um our students with autism they're served in a specific program and -hmm. we're getting and they're at they're bursting at the seams Mm -hmm. and would it be fair to say that many of those students use aac yes um and that has been um, a journey within itself um because it was at first we had a lot of the PECS based systems. Um, I mean, which, you know, posters and cards and lanyards and stuff. And then it transitioned to, um, they had these big old Dynavox, um, things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, once we got the iPads, then that's when I started investing into the software. So we would use Proloquo. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of our students, because of, um, insurance. They started using a lot of the accent devices. 
so that had the lamp software on it and i hated lamp i i is i like it's stupid the pictures don't make any sense to me i don't is uh, i just don't i just don't uh, understand uh, it everyone says that at first until until i drunk the kool-aid <laughs> I, right <laughs> after i went to the um the training the two-day training session then after I understood the method behind the madness, I'm like, I absolutely love this. Um, even if we stick with protocol, just the research behind LAMP and their their methodologies, it makes sense. And when you and, say the two-day training, was that up in Pittsburgh? Or did John Halloran or someone come down to you or nearby? Um, you know? No, we went to, um, they had, a, um, I um, joined a session in North Carolina. Gotcha. Okay. Cool, cool. So then, so where are you now with that then? The one-to-one -one devices, are they iPads? And are those what the kids are using for AAC? Ooh, okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, we have a blend in our district because this is what happened. At first we said everybody has an iPad um, for our um, special education department, but we had some students who could actually use a laptop. So... I went back to the group again and like, okay, let's develop a hybrid. So in a one, you can walk in one classroom and you'll have some students who'll have an iPad and some students who'll have a laptop. And then what we were finding with the iPads at the beginning of the process was that um, they were playing the games or going on, you know, the fun sites and using the fun apps versus using the communication device. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's not going to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so now our students, if you have, um, if we go through the assessment and say that you need um, a device for communication, you have a separate communication device and then you have your work device. Yeah, right. Just like, just like uh, any other student, they could use their voice while they're mm -hmm. to talk about their, their academic device. So yeah. why wouldn't someone else have who uses AAC use their voice on one device and use the academic to talk about the academics on another? Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's been a journey. Oh, and then um, prior to us purchasing the LAMP software or the LAMP apps for um, our devices, we had a lot of students who had their personal device. So we went to the lawyers to have some paperwork drawn up. So now we let um, students bring their personal devices from home. So it's a seamless transition. We don't have to develop a whole new system that if something is taught at school is carried over into the home. So that has made a big, a major difference and saved us a lot of money. So did you make the transition mostly to LAMP then? Or are you still, like you said, it's kind of all over the map. Some kids have Prolo Quo, some kids have LAMP. There might be a touch chat user. There's a, there's a yes, speak for yourself yes. user. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do That's you find where there's we one... are and my brain is like this <laughs> most of the time. Do you find that there's one particular app that comes out most frequently? Like if you put them all on a graph, you'd say like, well, LAMP is number one and Prolo Quo is our second you know, pop most popular and third would be touch chat and fourth is snap plus core. Like, do you have like a hierarchy like that? Um, Proloquo is our number, still our number one. Um, a lot of our um, practitioners, they're just more comfortable. And if you like, they have more um, wiggle room with Proloquo, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to creating folders and adding images um, and, and really customizing it to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. because I had um, a few teachers, they went in and um, like we have a student who's in a fifth grade social studies class and they're doing a lesson. So it was easier for them to kind of customize it so that they can answer the questions. You sure. know, yes. Um, then our sharp second is LAMP because of students with their personal devices. Um, that takes a little bit more work, but it is what it is. Um, and then after that is whatever hodgepodge comes in, um, because we have a, num a number of um, just outliers. Um, and so it's, sure. it's been a journey. <laughs> so where I work, that is very similar. You know, the, the switches we have lamp is, per is the one that's probably the most frequent with Prolo Quo being a number two, and then a bunch that fall underneath that as well. Something that we've had some good success with in our neck of the woods is the idea of teaching the teachers 
to describe those words rather than put them in the app, if that makes sense, like that those oh. curriculum words. So if the if the curriculum word was volcano, we'd say, well, how do you describe a volcano? Well, it's hot. It's it's a dangerous a triangle. Even if you're going to use like a noun, like you know, it's a triangle. Uh, those sorts of things, um, or put b- a bunch of core words together. It is hot. You know, I don't like it. It is dangerous. You know, those sorts of things. And we've been just starting to explore, I won't lie to you here, we just started to explore the idea of modeling, typing those words, like rather than finding them, let's work on spelling, you know, so let's try and go over to the keyboard and spell out volcano, turn on the word prediction, all of those, all of those apps have word prediction. And so when you start typing V, O, V, O, 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 volcano, there it is, find it. And then that starts to reinforce the spelling. Wow. Let me tell you. Okay. Cause I, I mean, we, I have a set of questions. I feel like you're interviewing me and not the reverse. Um, but I'm going to tell you when we watched your video, um, on the CTD Institute on um, assessment with secondary students, mm-hmm. I think that one, you blew my mind. So when I saw your name, like I had you, I was like, Oh my God. I said, but okay, Jamie, she said, have a list of questions. It has to deal with assessments and so forth. But I, I brought immediately the day after because I like I like I have my little book here and pretty much I was writing down notes the whole time. Because awesome. I'm like, it makes sense. Like, okay, we're not gonna say evaluation anymore. We're gonna say assessment. And I, I'm like, oh my God, this is what we need to like, we're gonna steal you. I'm gonna tell you right now, we're gonna steal your presentation. Great. And this is what we're gonna present to our LEAs because there's so much confusion during the IEP process and even the assessment process, because what I've run into, and this goes into one of my questions, is that um, everybody has a misconception about assessments anyway. A lot of the team come in and say, okay, our student needs a device for communication. And what we what we're finding is that, okay, we go into the meeting, the parent wants something, The teachers are trying to come up with a magic pill Mm -hmm. because they fear litigation. Mm -hmm. The parents say, I want you guys to buy this. And the district says, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's not right because we end up spending thousands of dollars and we give the student this Frisbee Mm -hmm. because that's all it is. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they get tossed around the classroom. Mm -hmm. And when I go in for like a follow-up and like, hey, you know, where's their device? Oh, it's in the closet. Mm -hmm. Or the parent sends it to school every day and it's not charged. Mm -hmm. And it's away somewhere. And I'm like, okay. You are, I think. Um, You know, how do you deal with that during the assessment process? And especially if your assessment and your observations are saying that this tool is not appropriate for Mm -hmm. the child. And that's why I'm trying to even get teachers and um, a lot of the members of the IEP team to understand that technology is a tool, Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to develop skills. It helps you to achieve your goals. And so um, this past year, um, we never really had one. So I created the um, assistive technology procedural manual. Okay. Let's talk about that. What is that? Okay. Um, well, let's you, say this. I, I, I'm a teacher and I have concerns about a student. How yes. do I use this tool? Okay. So the first thing that you do, I have an actual, um, I actually give you a form that's adopted from Wadi and SET. Okay. It's kind of put together and you will fill out the needs of the students, um, where they are, um, the goals, what would you like them to do um, or what you need to them to do? And this is not even adding the technology in. Mm-hmm. What is the end goal? What is the end game? What do we want this child to do? And so after that, because this is what we usually do or used to do in the times past. This was our AT assessment. So that is the task. task. Test of aided communication symbol performance. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And um, so that is just really for symbols too. Like when you say AT assessment, it's so much more yeah. broad than just communication. Yes. And so I feel that's not appropriate all the time. Mm-hmm. 
And mm-hmm. so that's why I developed the form, kind of marry all the pieces together. And so now I'm trying to hold everybody's hand through the process. So when you open the manual, it tells you step one, step two, step three, step four, you know. Um, but the thing is to get away a little bit from this assessment to having a broader assessment that kind of narrows in on what we want the child to achieve. And so you can gather all of this information and that actually helps you to write your IEP. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I felt that it's a little bit more helpful to teachers. I'm getting some feedback. Um, There's some pushback because they feel like, Oh, this is just more work, more paperwork. But my thing is we need a way of tracking. Mm-hmm. we are not tracking. We're not doing progress monitoring. We don't know what works, what isn't working. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know how many tools um, that we've used with a student that has been successful or unsuccessful. And so that's pretty much what the procedural manual is about uh, okay. for them to understand the process and then understand that this is not just a one-stop shop. This is an ongoing process because what you said, an assessment determines needs over time because the child, the student's needs changed over time. See, no, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Jamie, let me ask you a question here. What yes. do you think would happen if it wasn't the teacher filling that out, but if it was the team filling it out? So if the initial was, all right, I, I have this question. Let me mm-hmm. go to this, this process. And that process was not I, the teacher, but we, the team. And now we go through those questions that uh, Jamie has outlined in this process. Mm-hmm. And I ask them to the team and we collaboratively answer the answer, the questions. Mm-hmm. What do you think the, the results would be? Um, I think it would be a little bit more holistic because you're getting the opinions from a group of people instead of just looking through the eyes of one person. Because if I was the parent completing this, I would see it a little bit differently than the classroom teacher versus the SLP or the OT or the PT or the vision or hearing. So um, I think you get a more holistic view of the student. Mm-hmm. We we adopted that model um, in our neck of the woods where it is yeah. meant to be a collaborative decision. And we have a guide. We call it the resource consideration guide, but it's a guide where you kind of ask a series of questions. We same built it the same way, set and wadi, you know, mm-hmm. um, we started there as our, as our tent pole and then said, uh, we don't like this way. This is worded. Let's change this. And let's change that a little bit, but it's the idea is the same is that there's, please some share, framework. please share. <laughs> please well, share. I will tell you, <clears throat> um, we, it, 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 we are sort of beta testing it still. We haven't okay. actually launched it, but what our feedback so far has been, so it's not ready yet to, to give out to everybody, but okay. the idea is the same. What you have is the same. We're in the, we're, we're in the close, you know what I mean? We're, we're both on the same green here. If we're not in the same hole, you know, on, uh, we're definitely in the same golf course, you know? Um, so what we found is that this is cut down on the fighting too. Like, I came in thinking it should be pro lo quo. Well, I came in because I'm a lamp fan. Yeah, but my private speech therapist was saying touch chat. And now we're all people can't see it, but I'm punching my fists, you know? Yes. Instead, it's what we know the student needs AAC. What should we be considering? And now we come up with a decision together. We're all in together. You know, we're all in this together. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, my. I'm just so OK. I know I'm going to be bugging you. Don't don't take it personal, Chris. But I mean, because it's how can I say it's me here. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you're it. You're the team. I am the, the team. team. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, you know, you want to reach out to other professionals in, you know, in this area just because you know, my background isn't special education, Mm -hmm. um, but this is something that I fell in love with and had a passion for. um, And I'm learning as I go along and I'm seeing what's working. And I think it's good because I bring an outside perspective to the process. Like maybe we should look at it this way and not you know your way <laughs> jamie got to tell you what i'm thinking and if if anyone comes to any presentation i do i always have to say like my job title my actual job title in my school district is assistive technology specialist and then i say but i don't really like that term because it makes it think like i know all the answers i'd much rather be considered 
an inclusive design facilitator, an educational technology experience designer. The job title you already have is educational technology coach. It it branches it out to, to be um, about everybody. Do you know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. Technology is just stuff to help people, you know, and some people have disabilities and some um, have, have struggles, even if they wouldn't be called a disability, you know, uh, we're just all people, you know, so, and they, and technology helps people. And that's what you do. An educational technology person helps people, right? Yes. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So don't, don't fight the fight. My advice to you would be not to fight the fight to get an assistive technology specialist job. Keep it where you are. You have that great perspective that so many people that were in assistive technology or started that way have a kind of a narrow view, I think. Um, And even special ed might have a narrow view. Like I only help Mm -hmm. these kids, but you coming from an educational technology view has a much wider lens, I think. Yeah. And I think that has helped me because I'm looking at, you know, for everybody. Like I am a huge universal, I'm a UDL girl. <laughs> like we need to look at this approach for everybody. This will help everybody. This is how you can change your curriculum to meet the needs of all your students, you know, but again, I'm just a little fish in this big old pond. Okay. I need to ask these questions. So I'll make okay, sure. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because I know Dr. Oh, man, Dr. George was like, Jamie, what happened? We just ended up chatting the whole time. Um, I, you know, I, I oh, so tell me a little bit about your about yourself. What is your background? So my background is a speech language pathologist um, mm-hmm. in my I worked for the same school district, Loudoun County Public Schools, for all 22 years of my professional career. And mm-hmm. the first three years of my career, I was a speech therapist at a local elementary school. And then um, up here in Loudoun, there's like at the time it was probably 80 schools, you know, 75 to 80 schools were well over 90 schools now. Um, uh, so, so I was a speech therapist at one of the schools and then three years into the career, they said, Hey, you like technology. Would you like to be one of our founding members of our assistive technology team? And I was like, sure. So in year four, I became, um, half speech, half assistive technology. And they realized in that year that that doesn't really work because that's two full-time jobs, not one, you know what I mean? You can't do both Mm -hmm. of those well. So then ever since then, I've been assistive technology. Um, And now I, the last couple of years, I've been the assistive technology specialist. So I sort of guide the team of of what we call specialized instructional facilitators for assistive technology. So there's a, we have a team of, of nine of those and plus me, so 10. And then, of course, supervisors and, and directors mm-hmm. and assistant directors, everything up above. <clears throat> but there's like 10 of us that are kind of the, the core team, I would say. Mm-hmm. And that's it. I've been and I've been um, like I said, over the years, I've shifted my thinking to be thinking more about inclusive design. How do we use the technology to design things for everybody as opposed to here's the design of my lesson and it's broken. Now get technology to fix it. You know, no, I don't want to fix a broken lesson. I want to design the lesson. So it's not broken. You know? Yes. Yes. So, um, okay. So you've been there practicing as, are you still practicing? So I keep up with all my credentials, you know, like there's the American Speech and Hearing Association and we get a thing called the C's, uh, your certificate of clinical competence. And all that to say is that I keep up on all of that. You know, um, I, I worked too hard in my grad school days to, to lose that stuff. So um, ha- how has your knowledge as an SLP aid in assessing individuals well, that's a very excellent question. I mean, like we started out this conversation, Jamie, I, my view of assessment has really shifted um, from being a, sort of an expert that tells you this is how things are or what you should use to more of a team approach. So I think that my background in speech really helps me with the linguistic aspect of the AAC. You know, there's a lot of language there. I mean, it's, 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 it's the competency in AAC that I focus on the most is teaching kids the language because I feel like and teaching more so the adults, how to teach the language, do you know? Um, Like we were talking about earlier, how common is it that there's an assistive technology device, an AAC device that gets collecting dust on the shelf? That to me is an implementation problem, not necessarily a tool selection problem. Oh, if we just picked a different tool, then that would not get dust. No, it would. We have to teach you how to use it, you know? So I think that's how my background in speech has helped. 
Okay, um, so what type of assessments are you usually called in to evaluate? Just AAC? No, we help with any sort of situation. And like I said, we where I help mostly now and the team that I help, so I help the helpers right now. That's my current job title you know, or, or job, my roles and responsibility. And then occasionally I get called in to help in a specific case with a student. Mostly I'm helping the specialized instructional facilitators for assistive technology help the students, if that makes sense. Like, mm-hmm. um, But occasionally I get called in and AAC is certainly a big part of it, but it's really any sort of problem that happens. And we have been, like I said, we've been really trying to focus our time less on solving those fires when they pop up. Oh, this 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 student has this problem. How can we help them to, okay, we can anticipate these problems would exist. How can we design the instruction so they are not a problem, you know? Does that okay. help? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'll say this too, Jamie. I'll say we're not using any sort of formalized standardized assessment for those. It's, it's more... Um, like we're not using the communication matrix. We do, we've developed our own thing called the coal that I can share with you, mm-hmm. which is a, a language tool built in, built in a Google sheet where it's again, ask people questions about a student's linguistic ability and they can kind of rate that. Um, mm-hmm. And then that shows progress over time. You know, if I do that at the beginning of the year and do that, or, you know, once, and then a year later, I, I, you can see the growth of a student or, or not, whatever you can see. It's an evaluation tool, but that's, okay. And then then everything, all the standard SLP evaluation tools, we would still use those. We, as the assistive technology people, we're not. We would be just helping the, uh, the, the team uses those to develop a picture of a student, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and I think that's, I guess that's my long-term goal mm-hmm. because I want everyone to understand it's just, it's not just me. It's everybody that makes up the team. And I mean, the SLP, um, they're going to be the primary person at the school that works with the child. And so I'm trying to shift some things, I tell you. Jamie, speaking of shifting things, well, let me ask you, with the pandemic, Mm -hmm. is that still true that the speech therapist is the one, the primary person working with the, or more true than ever? Or is that changed? I'm curious how the pandemic has hit you in, in Beaufort. Um, It's more true than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, How they work with the student may have changed a little bit um, because they've had to do a lot of virtual, you know, um, sessions with the students. Um, A lot of our, I mean, because our speech, our our SLPs are kind of overwhelmed. I'll put it, their their caseloads are very large um, to the point where we don't have enough SLPs. Mm-hmm. Um, the director, she sometimes have to get out, like outside contractors to come in. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes she has to step into schools to assist um, with assessments and, and same service. thing here. Same thing here, Jamie. <laughs> my, my supervisor is the supervisor of related service. She's a speech therapist and she had to take mm-hmm. on kids this year just to cover the number yeah. of hours. So that's, I think that's a theme countrywide, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's an interesting situation, um, but um, oh, and I'm trying to remember the software that we just purchased to help do a lot of our virtual sessions. And a lot of parents, you know, they don't like it, but I mean, we had no choice. You know, mm-hmm. we can't go into the homes and then we made a gradual transition where if if you could see, I have all these little dividers and and blocks and we have facial masks and all sorts of sure. things. Um, but they started bringing um, students to the buildings to get served, even um, when our schools were closed. And in the end, it actually helped us to stay out of litigation, whereas um, the next state over, their parents are actually suing the school districts because the students were not served. Mm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we've been a, we were very proactive from the very beginning on how to serve our students, how to gradually bring them back. Um, but it, but I, our SLPs, they're rocking it. They yeah. really are. They really are. Well, I'll okay. tell you, Jamie, something that's happened that I keep hearing from other speech therapists is that 
this this pandemic has helped shift their mindset a little bit because those problems existed before the pandemic, like shortages of speech therapists, Mm -hmm. um, overwhelmed with caseload. Um, And another problem, tell me if this is consistent where you are, is that a, a student who has an AAC device might experience three different speech therapists in their elementary career two different speech therapists while they're in middle school, maybe one speech therapist, you know, they might have in their entire academic career, they might have six to eight different speech therapists. Is that accurate? Yeah. So who's the consistent force is the family, right? So, so one of the things we've been doing, so if we can get the family not to collect dust on the shelf, right. That if we could get them using that tool, then, then that's going to have the biggest bang for the buck. And so some of our speech therapists have pivoted and said, you know, less direct, more coaching. I'm going to help you family how to use this device. Let's talk about you and how you can use this device. And they've seen some success there, you know? Mm, coaching. Okay. I'm writing down notes again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because again, um, we meet with the SLPs for our district Thursday. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm going to be very truthful. I was hoping to pick your brain and get a lot of good information to, you know, awesome. give to them to help in, help in their process. Okay. So you already answered my question number five earlier. Mainly you guys work as a team to conduct an assessment versus an independent person. Okay. And in fact, like, even in the evolution there, Jamie, is we don't really even call it an assessment. It's just a brainstorming meeting, but we do have a guided a guide, this resource guide with some questions to kind of keep it consistent. So it's not just as open free flow. And the idea is that you're filling out the first column of this table. That's like, what does the student need? And occasionally, because we have some ex- expertise in this area, we'll be like, well, we might think that one of the things they need is access to a full keyboard. Is that, do, we all, do we all think that's something that they might need? Yeah, let's put that down as a thing. Mm-hmm. And as we come up with that, oh, they, you speak Spanish in the home? Yeah, you know, it might be important to have Spanish as a language on your AAC app. Let's put that as a thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, your student uses switches to access? We think switches is going to be the best. Let's put that as a thing. And then we figure out the tool based on that list that we developed together. See, that's going to be such a game changer. It is going to be. It has been for us. Danger. <laughs>